Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Worship at Aldersgate. Today is the second Sunday in Epiphany, and it's great to have all of you here this morning. We begin our worship service with joys and concerns from the congregation. I received them from you during the week on email, and there's a sign-up sheet at the back if you have ones to add. I'd like to know if there's anyone, uh, a joy or concern or prayer request for your children in the room this morning. Just like breathing, that we talk to you as much as we can. Thank you for hearing these prayers, and now hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, it's time to go get all those kids in the nursery. It's time for the children to come forward. Today is Game Sunday. So much. I think it's going to be awesome. I got an insider tip on your game, and it may or may not involve marshmallows. So much fun. Okay, let's pray. Please hold your hands. Lord God, we thank you for vacation weekend, for Martin Luther King weekend, and we thank you for Isaiah, who was brave and spoke your words to your people, and who also gave us great hope that Jesus is coming. We ask that we would have fun and play games, and that we would um, also have very good behavior, and thank you for our teachers. In Jesus' name, amen. Our song this morning is verse 36, verses 5 to 
10. We will read it together. Psalm 36. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice is like the great sea. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in the heart. And please now hear the scripture lesson from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 6, verse 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on his throne, high and exalted, and his robe filled the whole temple. Around him, flaming creatures were standing, each of which had six wings. Each creature covered its face with two wings and its body with two and used the other two for flying. They were calling out to each other, Holy, 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 the Lord Almighty is holy. His glory fills the world. The sound of their voices made the foundation of the temple shake, and the temple itself became filled with smoke. I said, There is no hope for me. I am doomed because every word that passes my lips is sinful, and I live among a people whose every word is sinful. And yet, with my own eyes, I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the creatures flew down to me, carrying a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with the burning coal and said, This has touched your lips, and now your guilt is gone, and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord, the Lord say, Whom shall I send? Who will be our messenger? I answered, I will go. Send me. Please pray with him. Lord God, once again, we thank you for this time and this space to be here in your presence, to hear these ancient words and know that through the power of the Spirit that they can be brought right into our lives today. We ask God that you would help us attend to your movement, that you would allow me to speak and to think clearly. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was working on the sermon this week, I came up with a couple of illustrations that worked pretty well, but I started to get intimidated because I knew that there would be many of you in this room who would know these facts and situations better than I would. And then I thought, oh good, I'll just ask them to tell us. I'll ask the expert in the room to tell us these two stories because one of you knows this story very well. First example, can somebody tell me how Tom Brady became the lead quarterback on the Patriots. Anybody? Hugh, nice loud voice. Yeah, he, uh, he became the uh, starter for Drew Bledsoe. Uh, went down in the game against the New York Jets and Brady came in and replaced him. And, and that's the history of it. That's when he started. I hope you all heard that. That uh, when Drew Bledsoe got injured, Drew Bledsoe, who was at that time the lead quarterback, was injured, in comes Brady. I did a little research on this and saw that when Brady was drafted in 2000, it was not that auspicious. He was one, number 199 in the draft, and he was drafted to the Patriots, and he was like a fourth string quarterback. And I guess he did all right that first season, went into the second season, 2001. And um, that was when that injury happened. And he had improved, so that now he was the number two guy. But that's when he came in. And I guess it took him a little while to get his stride. That's what the article was saying. And the first couple games didn't do so well. Maybe a case of the nerves or just learning. But then by the end of that season, what happened, Kevin? They won the Super Bowl. They won the Super Bowl with Tom Brady, right? Number 36 <laughs> as the quarterback. Pretty awesome. <laughs> And I'm just wondering, and I know this may take some imagination because we sort of think of Tom Brady as Superman, but I'm just wondering 
if for a little tiny moment when Belichick said, all right, man, you got to go in. Drew is down. It's your turn. If he had just a moment of, oh my gosh, I hope I'm good enough to do this. Some people may argue that he has supreme confidence. But just a moment of, oh my gosh, here it is. I am the guy. And when he took that mantle on the next week and the next week and wasn't doing super well, I wonder if he felt nervous. Am I good enough to do this? And I wonder if somebody spoke to him and said, Tom, you are so passionate about football. You absolutely love football. Did you know that he was drafted to be a major league baseball player as well? But he, yes. And I think it was Montreal who drafted him. Go look it up. He was, he's such a talented athlete. But he said no to it. Because he was passionate about football. You wanted to play football your whole life. You are good at it. You've got talent in it. And the circumstances around you have changed. And now it is time for you to step forward. And don't let those inadequacies hold you back. Boy, did he go on to shine. The rest is history, right? And we're looking towards the Super Bowl again. Okay, another story. I'm thinking that you have to be 60 years old or more or a student of history to know the specifics of this. I thought I knew it, but I actually had it wrong because I don't remember. Can somebody tell me how Gerald Ford became president? No one's like, Rrr. <laughs> I don't see what I, So let me go with John Wise, nice and loud from the back. Okay. So uh, back in the day, uh, Agnew resigned, and Nixon appointed Gerald Ford as vice president. And then when Nixon resigned, Ford became president. That is it. Yes, and I didn't have that exactly right in my mind, but Gerald Ford was a member of the House of Representatives. Very well respected. And I'm not 60, so. And you're <laughs> Thank you, yes. Well, I had a little out of order in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not 60 either. But, um, yes, 13 term representative from the state of Michigan, well respected House Minority Leader for eight terms. And so when Spiro Agnew stepped down in sort of the wake of this Watergate scandal, stepped down first, that's what I had wrong, they needed a new vice president. So they appointed this respected uh, Republican representative from Michigan, Gerald Ford. Then, when, Vice Pre when President Nixon resigned, now Gerald Ford is the 38th President of the United States. He's the only person who's been both Vice President and President without running for either office. And I'm just guessing here, but the, he was only President for less than 900 days, just under 900 days. And when it was time to run again, he deferred and he let Ronald Reagan run as the Republican nomination, did not win, um, let him run in that next election. I don't know that he really was thinking he will wanted to be president his whole life, right? That was not his thing. Interestingly, I did learn as he is the shortest presidency under 900 days, he's also lived the longest of any president, and I think those two go hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> he lived to 93 years old. But yes, here he is, a man who never set out to be president at all in the seat of the White House. And I wonder if he had a moment there where he thought, oh my gosh, am I equal to this? Are you kidding me? Am I going to be able to do this well? Did I even come by this honestly? And I wonder if somebody spoke to him and said, listen, man, you love government. You have been in this for so long. You have got a passion for it. And not only that, you're talented at it. You've been reelected 13 times as a representative. You have passion. You have talent. And now the circumstances around you have changed. And now is your time to step forward. Do not let your perceived inadequacy stand in your way. One very final example. I don't expect anyone to know this, but I threw it in for Carol. Carol, <laughs> sit up. There's an opera singer, oh. Carol, <laughs> uh, whose name is Licia Albanese, who is the lead soprano at the Met for 26 seasons during the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And this woman was just, you know, sort of a regular um, part of the stock singers in a little opera house in Milan in the 40s. And sure enough, the lead soprano in uh, Madame Butterfly is struck ill before opening night suddenly. And Lichia is called forward to sing the part, Cho Cho San. 
and she sings it so beautifully, immediately becomes recognized for what she brings to that part, goes to La Scala, goes to the Met, is hired on to just be one of the most uh, renowned sopranos that we've had in this country in the last century. Amazing. We get to think about that moment when she was suiting up and getting ready to sing that first performance if she had a little bit of self-doubt. But hopefully someone said to her, boy, you are so passionate, you love this stuff, and you are talented, and the situation has changed. Step forward, this is your moment, and don't let the inadequacy get in the way. I think that's what's going on with the prophet Isaiah in this story. And we've been going through the history of Israel, and we have... Um, now been going along in the kings of Israel. We remember it was a very, very bumpy ride. It was tough for them. They had a lot of kings. Their primary job is to love God first and then lead the nation uh, to be godly people so that the nation can represent God to the world. And most of the kings don't do it. In fact, only five out of 39 of the kings were considered to be godly kings. And so what God does is raise prophets to help speak the word of God to these disobedient kings, to help correct them. Last week we talked about Elijah, who felt the burden, the weight of that responsibility on his shoulders. And this week we moved to Isaiah. Now Isaiah was living, you remember that Israel split north and south, ten kingdoms in the north, just two in the south. Judah is in the south, Israel is in the north. Isaiah lived in Judah in that little territory. And there was a pretty good king on the throne, his name was Hezekiah most of Isaiah's young life. And things were going well for Israel, and because he was a godly king, things were fine. But then Hezekiah's son ascends onto the throne, and the son, like this, turns away from his father, and the way that his father ran things, and put up the shrines to the, the uh, idols from other nations nearby, and, and just immediately started derailing the nation of Judah. Now we can intuit, if we read more of the prophet Isaiah, that this is a man who is just passionate for God, who loves God, who was so respectful of King Hezekiah, who was one of his big fans, he knew he was going the right way. He was a talented speaker, a talented teacher, a communicator about God. And so when he sees this ungodly king on the throne, he is heartbroken because he knows what's going to happen to his nation. And so one day when he is in prayer, God gives him a vision. And he's crying out his heart to God, saying, I cannot believe there is an ungodly king, someone who does not love you, on our throne. And how pastoral. God, so awesome. The first thing that God shows him is a picture of the throne. And who's on the throne but God? And God said, you know what, there's a lot of earthly thrones, a lot of thrones all around the world, but I'm the one who sits on the heavenly throne. You don't forget that word of comfort for Isaiah. He sees that, and then he sees these seraphim, these seraphs. Uh, when there's an I am at the end of the word, it means plural. So an uh, angel, seraphim, fire beings. They're like glowing. He sees them around in that throne room, and he sees that they have six wings. We heard it twice already this morning, so you can probably tell me where those six wings were. Two cover the eyes, two cover the body, and two are flying. And I read a commentary that said, what a beautiful illustration of our work with God, that it would be humble and active at the same time. And so those seraphim are flying around and they're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah sees all of this. And honestly, his response sort of confused me at first. Woe to me, I am ruined. How was your translation? Do you remember? It was a little different than that. But like, oh no, right? This is awful. I feel terrible. What? I think it'd be kind of cool. That's my first impression. But think about it this way. If you see the most perfect thing near you, what you're going to do first is see how you measure up. Like, I think I'm a pretty good cook. I'm reasonable. I can get it done in the kitchen, right? I've had a lot of you over for dinner, and those of you I haven't, come soon, please. And I will go and I will make you a pizza or a pot roast or whatever it is and feel pretty good. But if Mario Vitale comes into my kitchen, now I'm feeling like an idiot, right? Because I know that he's an expert. Right? You may feel like, oh, I like to play the piano. I like to noodle around a little bit. And then Kyle walks in the room. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> right? 
never mind, right? No one is me. I am ruined, right? I can't. Whoa, I totally do not measure up to that. This is what Isaiah is experiencing. He's seeing the pure worship of the seraphim. He's seeing God who speaks only with truth. And Isaiah, who's a pretty good speaker, a pretty good teacher, knows that he absolutely does not measure up. I am ruined. And so then one of the seraphim, a seraph, flies over to the, the table in that throne room, the altar. And this being that is made of fire takes a coal that is so hot he has to use tongs to hold it. And he takes that coal and he touches it to Isaiah's unclean lips. And he burns away the sin. Isaiah understands that he has been purified, he has been refined from the burning purity of that coal. And that now his lips are clean. And so that when God says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Whole other sermon, by the way, I'm not referring to God's self as us. Interesting. Who will go for us? And I said, Isaiah's writing, here I am, send me. Like that, he's turned around. He had these perceived inadequacies and God spoke to him and said, don't let those things hold you back. Because this is how it is with leadership or service or vocation of any kind in the world. That we are born with certain passions, things that we feel strongly about, things we love, things that break our heart. We have that constitution. We're born with that. And then God also gives us some talent that can dovetail with that in some way so that we can use our talent to support the passions that we have. And then something will change. The circumstances will change. Drew Bledsoe will get injured. President Nixon resigns. The king dies. And the circumstances have changed, and it becomes our time to step forward into that service, into that leadership, into that activity, whatever it is. And it is so natural. All of us have that moment where we say, oh, I really not going to measure up. Like the other leader was really great, and I don't know. And what about all the bad things? But isn't it? awesome that when we are called into service in God's kingdom, in God's church, that it's not just a friend or a coach or a spouse that says, hey man, you can do it. You can do it. It will be great. It's God himself who says, yes, you can do this. Because it's not just the vision of Isaiah that he has a cold place to his lips. We have the cross. We have the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And we know that we are purified and forgiven through that, every single one of us. That Jesus died with that. And we can say we are set free because of that death and resurrection. Every one of us in this room, free, go do it. Don't let those inhibitions, those feelings of inadequacy hold you back. If you've got the passion, if you've got the talent, if the circumstances are lining up, will you please step forward? This is your time. Some of you have been called into leadership already here or elsewhere outside in the world. Some of you will hear that. You may not be called to lead. You may be called to serve. You may be called to give. Numbers of different ways to be called. But I pray that you would trust it. That when you are able to say, yeah, I'm passionate about that in a way that most people aren't. And I'm talented about that in a, in a certain way. Maybe not <coughs> over the top talent, but I've at least got something I can give. And when the circumstances line up, and God says, who shall I send? I'm going to send you. And you say, who me? Yes, you. Then you can say, here I am. Send me. Amen. <coughs> Lord God, I thank you for the passions and the talents that exist here in this room. And I ask God that you would help us to know that those things come from you. And so that when circumstances change, God, that you are giving us a call. God, we ask that you would help us with humility to answer the calls that you place in our life. So that we can serve you in this world, to serve your people, and serve your kingdom. We ask that we, you would receive this offering as an expression of our gratitude for all that you do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
may be seated for the announcements. A couple things to keep in mind uh, as you go out the door after you get your treats at uh, coffee hour, there is a table um, on the garden side of the foyer that has a bunch of books from the children's library that we are giving away, so please stop by and take as many as you want. Um, after church today, we are going to be having one of two, you can go to either, um, Aldersgate orientations for folks who are newer in the church and want to know um, what is a Methodist church, what about this Methodist church, and um, ask all sorts of questions. So uh, some of you have told me that you're coming to the class, but please, even if you haven't, if you'd like to attend, we'd be happy to have you. And it will be back in classroom four at the end of the education wing. That will also happen the same class next Sunday after church. This Tuesday, Reverend Rick McKinley is coming back to us. He was here in October to do a Discovering the Possibilities study. He's going to come and present the results of his study that he's done with our church and to talk about um, some specific details that we may want to think about and do. And he's great. He's really entertaining and very personable. There are about 30 of us that came in October. You do not have to have come to the October meeting to come on Tuesday night. So we just encourage you to come out Tuesday night at seven for that. And finally, just pencil it in on your calendar. I did this week secure the talent for the Mardi Gras celebration, which is on Tuesday, um, February 9th, which is Fat Tuesday Mardi Gras. Uh, so come here at six o'clock for dinner and fun games, DJ, so much fun. We have just a blast. It's just a good time, that's all there is. So put it on your calendar now. Um, for celebration and thanks, um, you can see the ones from last week. My sheet is blank, which means I need to take one from the floor. Who would like to celebrate or thank someone this week? Just no gratitude here in the church at all. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Carol. Um, I'd like to thank Nicole for stepping in for Sam's week. Yes, Nicole, thank you for stepping in. <laughs> Ably done, Nicole, anytime. All right, well, if that is all, please stand for the benediction. We are getting out super early for good behavior. <laughs> That's not true. We love to be in church, but sometimes the Holy Spirit takes over and goes a long time, and sometimes the Holy Spirit allows you to be very concise, and that is a great thing. May God, who has blessed us with passions and talents and opportunities, may that God who also helps us know our forgiveness May that God be with us until we meet again in the name of the Father.